Hi, my name is Steve Pearton and August 31st, 2011 was a day that changed my life. I was just working in my office, um, working on email, um, working on some scientific papers, nothing unusual. Probably 11.35, something like that. Uh, I went over to the union building for lunch. Pretty much most days, unless I have a meeting or a lecture runs long, I always come around the same time, try to beat the rush for classes that get out at 11.35. And I had no unusual feelings, it was just a normal day. Um, I stood in line for a salad, healthy salad, uh, and then I sat down with my friends. Probably within uh, two or three seconds, I felt faint, extremely weak, and uh, I remember my vision just disappearing like a TV turning off, and I remember falling to the left. And that's all I remember for three days. I felt a thud. It was right there. And all of a sudden I saw Professor Pearton collapse next to the table next to me. The guy is on his back. I don't know who he is. Everyone's freaking out. And I wasn't really sure what to do because he was with his colleagues and they kind of looked like they were helping him, so I wasn't sure whether or not to step in. And then I saw David, who of course I didn't know at the time. He stepped up and was like, hey, I'm a lifeguard. Like, do you guys want help? And they were like, yes, please. So I was like, oh, I'll go help too. Because that kind of thing, like, you never want to be doing it by yourself as a lifeguard. It's terrifying to even deal with that. Like, even with two people, even with three people, like, that's something you don't want to go through alone. My first instinct and in gut was he was choking. He was gasping for breath. I just started chest compressions. I saw his face start kind of turning purple and he was twitching a little bit but then I recognized some of the symptoms of cardiac arrest. It really went from a normal day to pure chaos really, really quick. We had a call for a sick injured person at the Rights Union. Who was in cardiac arrest. Actually, cops came with the right equipment. Uh, they had the AED, they had the face mask, and I thought my part was done. David tried to get up and stop doing CPR, and myself and Officer Peck told him, you know, no, keep doing what you're doing while we get ourselves set up. Officer Kazar was doing the breaths and then uh, one of the students continued to do the compressions. At that point we got the defibrillator on there. We paused for just a second and allowed the AED to analyze Mr. Pearton. Uh, it notified us that a shock was needed. And uh, administered a shock. Fortunately that didn't correct the problem. And so we stepped in. Uh, when we approached him, he was blue. But it was, a, it was a complicated scene because we had it was Rice Union food court at lunchtime. We had to uh, you know, get IV access. We put our monitor on him. It showed a little rhythm. And when it showed a little rhythm like that, we have to start performing CPR and uh, B, uh, BLS, ALS procedures. Uh, we had to shock the patient several times, which is rare. We did CPR all the way through the hallway, down the elevator, got him into the truck, and um, I intubated him uh, right before we left. Anytime that we see EMS grab somebody, throw them on a stretcher, and run out the door, that's when you know it's bad. Clinically, you're, you're, you're already, I would say, dead, you know, but there's something we could work with, fortunately. We continued CPR the whole way to the hospital. Um, you could even see him moving a little bit which I think might have been just from the CPR circulating the blood, you know, uh, through his body, because uh, he would move his arms a little bit and, and almost uh, gag at the tube occasionally. So we knew we had a good shot at, uh, at getting him back. When the patient arrived, EMS was performing chest compressions as they rolled into the recess bay. And what stands out in my mind even today was the color of his skin. He was cyanotic pretty severely. He was purple basically from the clavicles all the way up to the top of his head. And I remember thinking, oh no, this is not good. I hope we can turn this around. EMS transferred him to our stretcher. We continued CPR and our focus was on high quality CPR. We had um, doctors putting in central lines, arterial lines. Um, the nurses were given the medications through his IVs, the fluids. So there were multiple times when he regained a pulse, but he would lose it again quickly. 
He received uh, multiple different shocks, which is also bad. Um, and at the point that he did get a pulse back, we immediately captured an EKG, and that's when we saw that he had the STEMI, or the ST elevation MI, or heart attack. STEMI alert. There's a page that goes out system-wide that lets us know that a patient is coming who has, is suffering a heart attack. We were getting set up for a patient who was in shock, having a heart attack, and not doing well. He comes in, he is not responsive, he's on multiple medications to raise his blood pressure, he's on a breathing machine, so we have respiratory therapy, we have the cardiac cath staff, we have our fellows, our nurses, our techs. We're obviously in a hurry because the, 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 best, pa the best outcome for this patient is if we can open up his artery the quickest. So we're, we are in a big hurry to get him on the table, get him prepped, and get ready to get in there and find out which artery is the problem and get it open. The culprit, so-called, the, the blood vessel that we thought was the one causing the problem was the front artery to the heart. We call it the LAD, which is short for left anterior descending. Uh, some folks call the proximal portion, the upstream portion of the LAD, the widowmaker. You have to be able to access the artery, so you have to get a wire down the artery. The wire is your railroad track, if you will. Uh, no wire, you, no procedure. So it took a little time to get the wire down because the vessel was occluded and it was hard to get the wire downstream past the occlusion. Once we got the wire down, we use a little device, which has a fancy name, but it's nothing more than a little straw. And that we, we send that device down to take clot out. We suck the clot out. Once we do that, hopefully we restore some flow to the vessel and we can see the size of the vessel, how bad is the disease, what do we need to do further. He actually required a lot more work than is typical for our heart attack patients. We ultimately ended up with a very, very good result angiographically, and I think that held up clinically over time. And we can spend a lot of time talking about the success of the procedure that I did, but ultimately what I did wouldn't have mattered much if the two students hadn't done CPR and they knew what to do. This was a full team effort. If, if someone's not on scene doing good CPR or, or using the AED, like in this case, uh, the chances of survival are minimal. I think everything happens for a reason, so you can call it like divine intervention or fate or whatever you want, but I think we were definitely supposed to be there at that time. It was, it was a hell of a coincidence, uh, but when it comes down to it, I'm just a cog in the entire process that saved that man's life. Those are the kind of calls that, that, you, um, that you hope to be involved in, because uh, there are a lot of other, other calls and other things that we do that, that aren't very enjoyable, but uh, when, you, when you have a call like that and you think about it afterwards, it, it really makes you uh, enjoy your job, and it, it, does, it does bring a lot of happiness. That's one of the big reasons why I'm here, you know, and that's, that, that kind of stuff, you can't, uh, yeah, I don't know any other job in the world where I could get that kind of gratification. Uh, I can't exp express, uh, you know, my gratitude to the students, um, the EM EMS, the police who also came. Um, to they kept me alive. They got me the chance. Uh, Dr. Beatty and the other doctors who were there at admission. Um, and then Dr. Anderson, for people to have that kind of skill and that kind of, um, you know, ability to perform under pressure because I didn't have any margin for error, zero. Um, and they pulled me through. So I'm incredibly grateful.